ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم اياك نعبد واياك نستعين The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he faced one of his most difficult times in a year which we call Am al-Huzn the year of grief the year of sadness the year of sorrow and to really understand how sad that year was how much hardship the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to go through we have to understand the circumstances in mecca at that time we know that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had been calling his people to become muslim for over 10 years and you know most of them didn't become muslim but some of them did become muslim However the ones that didn't become muslim the non believers they would torture the muslims and it got really bad to the point that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told his followers you know what i think it's time that you guys have to go and migrate you need to do hijrah to al habasha abyssinia present day ethiopia it got to that point But some of them they couldn't go and do the hijrah for whatever reason, money reasons, or they just want to stay with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So for those people, the mushrikun, the non-believers, they would torture them excessively. We have the story of Bilal ibn Rabah, who his shirt would be taken off. He would be placed on the burning sands in Mecca, and a huge boulder would be placed on his chest. and he would say nothing but ahad un ahad you have the story of habab ibn al arab hot burning iron would be placed on his back to the point that his back would start sizzling and you can smell his skin burning off and then you have the family of yasir who were placed in the streets and killed in broad daylight that was the kind of suffering that was the kind of torture that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions had to go through and throughout these times the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had a few things to keep him motivated a few things to tell him you know what you can do it keep going don't worry about it the first and most important thing of course was knowing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had his back Knowing that no matter what happened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there for you at the end of the day. So he had that. The second thing that he had was the Quran. It was being revealed as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was going through those hardships. The stories of previous prophets would be mentioned reminding the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that Sayyidina Nuh went through this. Sayyidina Ibrahim went through this. Sayyidina Yusuf went through this. Everyone goes through hardships. and everyone makes it through these hardships so you will make it through these hardships as well oh prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but other than that he had two very profound people two very important pillars in his life to keep him going the first of whom was his wife khadija radiyallahu anha his wife for over 25 years the mother of the believers the first woman to believe in the message of Islam the person who was there for him when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came running down saying zammiruni zammiruni dathiruni dathiruni she was there for him throughout all of this so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he knew that no matter how difficult it got outside the moment he would step into his house he had this person to console him to bring ease to him 
and the second person was none other than his uncle, Abu Talib. And for us to understand the relationship between the Prophet and Abu Talib, we have to realize that he wasn't just an uncle to the Prophet. You know, for many of us, we see our uncle maybe once or twice a year during Eid or something like that, and then we never see them again for the year. For the Prophet وسلم, he was his father figure. Because the Prophet وسلم, his father passed away before he was even born. His mother passed away when he was just six years old. His grandpa passed away at eight years old. And from that point, until he got older, he was taken care of by Abu Talib. Those were the two pillars that the Prophet وسلم, had in his life. And during that year, during Am Huzn, during the year of grief, the year of sadness, the year of sorrow, he lost both of these people. First, he lost his wife, and as I mentioned, the person who was always there for him for 25 years, she passed away. And then the scholars say about three weeks after that, Abu Talib also passed away. And I want you to imagine someone who you care about so deeply, someone who you've lived with for 25 years, you know, someone who's there for your highs and your lows, someone to always comfort you, to bring a smile to your face. Imagine walking home and that person is gone. They're no longer there to comfort you anymore. You walk into the kitchen, the smell of the food isn't there anymore. Actually, it smells lifeless. And then you tell yourself, you know, maybe that person is in the bedroom. Let me go check it out. And so you go there, but they're still not there. This is the kind of hardship that the Prophet ﷺ went through. But see, at least with the passing away of Khadija, عنها, the Prophet ﷺ had a few things to console him. Once Angel Jibreel came to him and he told him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala personally <coughs> sent me to inform you that he says salam to Khadija. So he had that source of consolation. <coughs> Another narration tells us that when I go to Jannah, this is the Prophet وسلم, saying, when I go to Jannah, my wife in Jannah will be Khadija. So he was happy knowing that he will be with her in Jannah. So he had that. But then with the passing away of Abu Talib, things were much more bleak. Things were much more sad. The narrations, they tell us that when he was getting older, when Abu Talib was getting older and he was on his deathbed, Someone came to the Prophet وسلم, and he told him, he told him, I think your, your uncle is on his last breath. So the Prophet وسلم, he rushes to his uncle's side, goes in the room, kneels down next to him, grabs his arm, and tears begin to flow from his face. And then the leaders of Quraysh are also there, because Abu Talib was one of the leaders. So you have people like Abu Jahl surrounding him. So the Prophet وسلم, he whispers in the ear of his uncle Abu Talib and he tells him, O oh, uncle, say these few words so that I can intercede for you on the Day of Judgment. Just say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah so that I can stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness for you. And the narrations they say that Abu Talib begins to move his lips. <coughs> And at that point, Abu Jah realizes this, and he tells himself, is he really gonna become Muslim? I need to do whatever it is to stop him from becoming Muslim. So he goes to Abu Talib and he tells him, are you really gonna leave everything that you've worked hard for throughout your entire <coughs> life just to follow this new religion that your nephew came up with? Are you really gonna ignore your forefathers just because of this new religion? Your family would be ashamed if you did that. <clears throat> and at that point, Abu Talib, he got weak, and he couldn't resist. And he tells his nephew, he tells the Prophet wasallam, I can't listen to what you told me to do. I can't say these words. And he died in that state. And the Prophet he runs out of the room. And the Sahaba, they say, we could see the grief, the sorrow on his face. 
We can see how hurt the Prophet ﷺ was that his uncle didn't become Muslim before he passed away. And it was at this moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْ You do not guide those who you want to guide. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides those who he wants to guide. And this ayah is so profound because it's actually met as a consolation for the Prophet ﷺ. Telling the Prophet ﷺ that, listen, you did everything that you can. Because the Sahaba, they tell us that the Prophet ﷺ was thinking to himself, could I have done something better? Could I maybe have said something better? Maybe my way wasn't good enough. If I said this or that, maybe he would have listened to me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, don't bother yourself with it. You did everything in your power. The rest is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And subhanAllah, the Sahaba, they remembered this so vividly that even 10 years later, during Fath Mecca, when Abu Bakr brings his father to become Muslim, <coughs> His father whom he preached to for 20 years to become Muslim. And I want you to imagine this with me. Your own father. You've been telling him to become Muslim for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And finally today's the day that he's becoming Muslim. What would you give up for that? I know I've spoken to many people. And every one of them, they tell me, I will give everything up just so my mom, my sister, my brother, my dad can become Muslim. So Abu Bakr, he brings his father to the Prophet wasallam so he can give the shahada. And at that point, while he's giving the shahada, Abu Bakr begins to cry. <coughs> and the Prophet wasallam looks at him and tells him, surely you're crying because you're happy, Abu Bakr. You should be happy, this is a great day. And Abu Bakr looks at him, radiallahu anhu, and he says, these are tears of sadness. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's shocked. Tears of sadness. Your dad's become Muslim. That's one of the best things that can happen. What's wrong? What's up? And Abu Bakr tells him something so powerful. He says, I remember the day that your uncle passed away as a non-Muslim. And I remember the sadness and the sorrow that you had on your face. And I would trade my father's Islam for your uncle's Islam. Because I never want to see that sadness on your face ever. SubhanAllah, these were the people who surrounded the Prophet Sallallahu And that wasn't the end of it. This all happened during Aan al huzn And then later on, that same year, the Prophet ﷺ, after suffering through the tragedy of his wife and his uncle passing away, he told himself, it seems like I need to go somewhere else for now, to call other people to Islam. So he go, goes to a nearby place called al -Qa'if. And he goes to the leaders of al -Qa'if and he asks them, out of respect, you're going to a new tribe, you're going to a new people. He's respecting them and asking them, is it okay if I preach to your people? And they tell him, absolutely not. You can't preach to our people. We want you to leave right now. <laughs> so again, the Prophet wasallam, he respectfully says, you know what? I understand. I'm going to go back to Mecca. But they don't stop there. They gather their women, their children, and the men, and they line up next to the Prophet wasallam as he's leaving, as he's exiting a ta'if, and they each grab rocks, and they begin throwing it at the Prophet ﷺ until his feet begin to gush with blood. These are the kinds of hardships that he went through in one year. And subhanAllah, I'm not saying this story just so we can feel emotional. I'm not saying this just so I, so I can pull on the heartstrings. But there's a lesson to be learned, and that is, we know that the Prophet ﷺ, he got back up. We know that he resumed stronger than ever before. And he preached stronger than ever before. And he was more motivated than ever before. But the question is how? How do you pick yourself back up after you've been pushed down to the ground so hard? How do you do that? And it was at this moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the journey of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. 
the journey to Jerusalem and then ascension to the heavens. And the Prophet وسلم, he was going with Angel Jibreel. And he kept going with him until he reached a certain place and he looked around him and Angel Jibreel wasn't there anymore. And then he looks below him and he stopped. So he tells him, you've been with me throughout this journey, are you not going to come up? And Angel Jibreel says, O Prophet of Allah وسلم, this is my limit. I can't cross this threshold. From here on out, you're the only person that can cross. You're closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than anyone, anything has ever been. So at this moment when the Prophet sallallahu is closer to Allah than anyone has ever been, Allah gives him a gift, a special present. He gives him the gift of the five daily prayers to tell him, this is the cure to your hardships. This is what will keep you going. This, the salah is what's going to help you. And look at how the Prophet sallallahu looked at the prayer. He says, <laughs> the coolness, the calmness has been placed in prayer. The calmness of my eye has been placed in this prayer. And for us to understand it, we have to really envision what this means. What is Qurratu Aini? Imagine walking in a desert, in a hot desert. The sand is blowing in your eyes. You know when sand gets stuck in your eyes and you begin to itch it, and it gets even more annoying, it gets worse. <laughs> and it's already hot, you're already sweating, it's already bad enough. And then in the distance you see a lake, and you go to the lake, you put some water, and you wash your eye with it. How relaxing, how cooling does that feel? This is what the Prophet وسلم, compared the prayer to. You know, the day might be tough. The journey might be arduous. But when you stand up, when you say Allahu Akbar, that coolness, that relaxation falls on you. And the Prophet وسلم, when he would want to tell Bilal radiallahu anhu to call Adhan, he would tell him, not call Adhan Bilal. He would say, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Bring us comfort by you calling us to prayer, O Bilal. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he says, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا حزبه أمر فزع إلى الصلاة. If a calamity was in front of him, if he was in some kind of hardship, the first thing he would do, was he would say, you know what, give me a few minutes, let me go pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take this hardship out. And after he prays, then he deals with the situation. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, he could pray at any time. Whether there was a storm, or whether there was an eclipse, or even on the battlefield, the Prophet وسلم, would always be praying. Because it was a source of relaxation to him. <coughs> as a matter of fact, as the day got longer, the day got harder, the Prophet وسلم's prayer would be more intense. It would be more. For us, you know, we have a long day at work. We want to come and we want to rest and we want to sleep. We'll pray our Isha, two minutes, we'll go to sleep. Because our source of relaxation is in sleep. The Prophet ﷺ's source of relaxation was in the prayer. And so the question poses itself, you know? You might be thinking, I'm someone who, who's constantly praying, alhamdulillah. And may Allah make us among those who are constantly keeping up with our prayers. But, I'm just not feeling my prayer. I don't feel like it's taking that hardship out. What's wrong? What am I doing wrong? And this is a really important point because the thing is, just like anything important in life, we need to learn how to pray. You know, you go and speak to a pharmacist, you go to sp and speak to a lawyer, you go to speak to a teacher and you tell them, how did you get to where you are? And they won't tell you, I just woke up like this. No, no, no. They'll tell you, I had to spend years on years on years to learn about this. I had to dedicate time and effort and money. This is how I got to where I am. Because anything that's important in life, we need to dedicate some time to it. Same exact thing with the prayer. We need to dedicate time to learn the prayer. And so the first thing that we have to learn 
is how to pray properly. What's the pith of prayer? But that's an easy part, you know? You can go read a few books, speak to some scholars, and they'll guide you. That's the, that's the easy part. The tough part is really understanding how to interact with our prayer. How do we feel our prayer? And to do that, we have to understand what we're doing, what we're saying. I'll give you a small example. When we say, Allahu Akbar, when we raise our hands, what does that signify? Why are we raising our hands? Have you ever thought about that? Why am I raising my hands? What does Allahu Akbar mean? So the scholars, they say, when you raise your hands, it's a signal, a wisdom behind it, as if you're throwing everything behind you. Oh Allah, I'm only focused on you. <laughs> everything in this dunya, I'm throwing it behind me for right now. And then you say, Allahu Akbar. Akbar is the comparative form. Greater. Okay, Allah is greater. Greater than what? Sure, Allah is greater than everything, of course. But in this moment, why are you saying greater? Because in this moment, Allah is greater than anything that could be worrying you. Whether it's the phone ringing, or the doorbell ringing, or whether it's your finances, or your school, or if you're having a problem with your family, whatever the case is, at this point, oh Allah, nothing is important other than you and talking to you. And that's why it's one thing that we're, we repeat in prayer is Allahu Akbar, to remind us right now the most important thing is you, oh Allah. Nothing else matters but you. A constant reminder. You know, when you read Surah Al Duha, what does Al Duha mean? Why is it wadduha? What's the point of wadduha is a swear, it's an oath. Swearing by the morning sunshine. Why? What's, what's the point in that? Have we ever stopped and reflected? Because if we don't understand why, what we're saying or why we're saying it, then we're not really going to feel our prayer. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those to feel our prayer. <laughs> بدأت ببسم الله في القول أولا تبارك رحمنا رحيما ومولا وثنيت صلى الله ربي على الرضا محمد المهدى إلى الناس مرسلا وعترته ثم الصحابة ثم من تلاهم على الإحسان بالخير وبلا وثلثت أن الحمد لله دائما وما ليس مبدوءا به أجزم العلا وبعد فحبل الله فينا كتابه فجاهد به حبل العدا متحبلا. Brothers and sisters, right now we are in a very important time, both culturally and Islamically. Why? Because it's the new year. A new year signifies change. We're always thinking of what can I change. Similarly, Islamically, Ramadan is three months away. So we need to start implementing new change. We need to start thinking what we can improve. And immediately we start to think of all the extra things that we can add. You know, maybe I want to read a little bit more Quran. Maybe I want to give some more money. Maybe I want to come to the masjid more often. And these are all fantastic. These are all great. But what we always overlook are the basics. You know, nobody comes and says, I want to perfect my prayer. These are the basics that we have to dedicate some time to. Perfecting the fara'il. You know, when you go and you complain to your dentist, you tell him, how can I keep my teeth clean? He doesn't give you a thousand dollar toothpaste. He tells you what you need to do is you need to consistently brush your teeth. It might cost, what, one dollar a month? But it's by consistently doing the small things. By consistently mastering the ordinary, we become extraordinary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith Qudsi, the Prophet says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا تَرَطُّهُ عَلَيْهِ And my slave servants, they can't get closer to me more than they can through the, through the obligations that I have placed on them. 
And then after mastering that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهِ And then after you master that, after you master your basics, the most important things, then you can begin to add more and more. You know, we should view nawafil extras, extra prayer, extra Qur'an, as the icing on the cake. But the thing is, if the cake has a defect in it, or if there's no cake at all, what would you do with icing? I ask Allah to make us amongst those who connect with the Qur'an, who connect with the prayers. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يشكركم يذكركم واشكروه يزدكم وأقم الصلاة